Well, praise the Lord, everybody. It is 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. That means it's 4 o'clock here on the East Coast. We greet you this afternoon in the name of the Lord from Merritt Island, Florida. Once again, we are in my mom's living room. Uh, it's actually rather hot and humid outside today. And uh, as I mentioned last week, we have a number of factors that we kind of came into uh, knowledge of when we tried to do our broadcasts on a live uh, remote. And one of those is that it begins to, the sun begins to set while we're actually having church. So the lighting is consistently changing and we can't really count on it to be very consistent. So we've decided to have our service indoors again today. This will be our final service for this trip from Florida next Sunday and beyond. Um, we will be back in Dallas, so uh, we hope you'll keep us in prayer this week. Um, we'll be leaving for Florida, excuse me, for Texas, probably about... Tuesday or Wednesday at the latest. We need to get back in time. We have some appointments and some things to take care of. Um, so we're going to be leaving by Tuesday or Wednesday or so. And we'll ask that you keep us in prayer during that time. And God will give us safe passage and we'll get back home. It has been a wonderful, restorative um, trip. We've really enjoyed being away from things for a while. You know, uh, we have a lot of decisions to make and a lot of things we need to do when we get back to Texas. And we don't know what doors the Lord is going to open. We don't know what direction we'll be going in. But we have many things we have to do simply in preparation for whatever may come. And uh, we're going back with a renewed sense of uh, vision and we have clear heads. We've been, you know, sometimes when you go on vacation, you only go for a week or so. And it really doesn't give you enough time to be away from things, you know, and to clear your head. But this trip has been uh, about a month and that's given us a really good amount of time to just step away from it all and just step away from everything. And so going back, I feel like we're going to have uh, new energy and new enthusiasm and new hope. And we'll be able to, to do the things we need to do, I believe, and I hope uh, with greater energy and enthusiasm. All right, we want to begin our service today. I am once again in my mom's living room, so uh, that's where you're seeing us today. But we want to begin our service with a word of prayer, so if you'll bow your heads with me. Father, today, Lord, we love you so very much. I had the, excuse me, I had the volume on that thing totally turned off, and it still does that, even when I put it on, uh, here, yes. even when I put it on Do Not Disturb, that phone still rings without fail, so excuse me, let's try that again. Father, we love you today, God, we thank you. Lord, for this opportunity to come together as the people of God, to worship you, to hear from the word of the Lord, to receive that nourishment which our spirit needs, God, and to hear from the word of God which inspires and encourages our faith to grow and prosper. Lord, at this hour, we need desperately a move of God in the church. We need revival in the church. And Lord, we cannot bring anything or send anything upon people who have no desire for this. But Lord, we today can make ourselves available to you. 
for revival and for restoration. And we ask God right now in the name of Jesus that during the course of this service, you would revive us, move in our spirit, stir us up at this hour, cause our faith, God, to explode. And let the power of God be manifest in our life in a brand new way. Jesus, today, Lord, touch hearts, touch lives, save those that need saving, reclaim the backslider, bring healing to those who are sick, and Lord, today, deliverance to those who are bound. Master, today, move in a mighty, wonderful way, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Now, Christmas was just yesterday. We don't always have the Christmas holiday on the Saturday um, immediately before a service. So we're actually going to do things a little bit differently today than we normally do things. Because the holiday was just yesterday, um, I'm still going to be in something of a Christmas vein today. And there's a reason that I'm doing this, and when I bring the message out, you'll understand why. Uh, that You might call this Christmas service number two, okay? Uh, but because Christmas was just yesterday, uh, we're going to kind of stay in the Christmas vein for today. And uh, we're going to sing a couple of carols, and we're going to uh, sing another song, and then we'll go into the message. Amen. But let's begin today with the, the old Christmas hymn, Angels We Have Heard on High. Hey. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plain, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joy. Your strength, Maria, in excelsis Deo, Maria, in excelsis Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What a gladsome tidings be, which inspire your heavenly songs. Christmas songs. Hark the herald. 
several angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild god and sinners reconciled joyful all ye nations rise join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim christ is born in bethlehem hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king Hail the heavenly Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, life and light to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to Yeah. <laughs> 
Gwen, so Gwen I know who Jesus is. I'm Gwen, I know who Jesus is. He's more than just a story. He is the King of Glory. I'm Gwen, I know who Jesus is. Praise God, amen. I love that old song today. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. And that's the truth today. I am glad that I know who Jesus is. Praise the Lord. I'm going to move this over a little bit this afternoon. Set it over here so I can better see it. Amen. Use this for my notes this afternoon. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now I've got to tell you, <clears throat> um, last week I brought a message that I titled, um, God my Father. And there were a couple of little things in that message that I failed to bring out. And I kind of felt bad afterwards because they were just little points that I did want to make. And I did want you to hear uh, one of those being this simple truth. It was interesting that in our primary text last week, the Lord was 12 years old when he was lost and and uh, Mary and Joseph, and uh, they didn't know where he was at. And they had to go all the way back to Jerusalem and they found him in the temple uh, speaking and talking with the wise men and the teachers of his day. And the word of God tells us how astonished they were at his wisdom and at his understanding. And what I wanted to share last week was how uh, this was so appropriate and so perfect timing because it is at the age of 12 or 13 that young boys in the Jewish faith are bar mitzvahed and it's at that time that they pass from youth or childhood according to Hebrew teaching into adulthood and they go into the uh, synagogue and they they uh, recite portions of the Torah and they sing certain of the prayers and what have you to show that they've attained a certain level of spiritual understanding and knowledge. So isn't it interesting that God bar mitzvah Jesus? Amen. He literally did what they do by tradition. He did it just without there having to be a formal ritual or a ceremony. But it was at that time in his life when, according to Jewish teaching, a boy becomes a man. And that's when Jesus was in the temple confounding the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of his day. At that moment in time, he was becoming a man. I talked about the fact that the Lord did not assume the mantle of Christ at uh, his baptism with John, but rather he already, he was born the Christ, amen. The angels declared him to be the Christ in the manger. But here he is at 12 years old at that critical moment, at that hinge in time when we go from boyhood to manhood, according to Hebrew teaching, that he was demonstrating his Christhood. Amen. He was demonstrating the depth of his spiritual knowledge and the depth of his understanding. And when the Lord later went on to say, all that my Father has taught me, I do. And we might say, well, when in the world, what is he talking? You know, the Trinitarians say, well, see, this shows you that up in heaven, the Lord. Listen, if if you believe Trinitarian teaching, then you believe Jesus is one of three in the Godhead, and that they're all supposed to be co-equal, and they're all supposed to be. So why would the Father had to have taught him anything? 
if he's co-equal, you know. Uh, no, that isn't at all what he was saying. But he was saying that since the day I was born, the Spirit of God has been teaching me. Hello now. Amen. His teaching did not come only from mom and Joseph. His teaching did not only come from his peers and from uh, adults that lived around him, but from the moment he was born, the Lord Jesus Christ, the physical man, the child Jesus, was being groomed and taught by the Spirit of God. Amen. So that even at the age of 12, the level of understanding that he had confounded the wise men and the learned men of his day. Amen. All right. That's all I'm going to say that... Uh, that uh, harkens back to last week's message. This week, I have a word that the Lord has placed in my heart, and I certainly hope that I'll be able to deliver it to you. If you have your Bibles, then you would join me in Matthew, the second chapter. I'm going to read the first 18 verses, so it'll be a little bit of a long passage, not too terribly bad. We're going back... Once again, to the Christmas story, at least to a portion of it, amen. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18, and the word of the Lord reads in this fashion. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was born, or where the young child, excuse me, was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, listen carefully, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word for Herod, and uh, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked 
of the wise men was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer once again. Father, once again, God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to break the bread of life, to hear from you at this hour, O oh God, that our spirit might be fed and our faith might be encouraged. We ask, God, that you would bless the delivery of the word of God. Help me, Lord, to deliver that which you placed in my spirit for this hour, that the people might be edified thereby. Prepare every heart of every hearer, that they might receive that which I am about to deliver. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Let me blow this up a little bit. That'll make things a lot easier. Whoa, for me. Amen. You know, it is, whoops, I'm trying to blow it up a little bit, and I'm, uh, I actually made it smaller. Come on now, here we go. Okay. Oh, my goodness. It's often represented that the events of Christmas all transpired on one single day, and the birth, and the truth of the matter is that they did not. The wise men did not find the Lord uh, after the, the star first appeared to them. This was a story of persistence and perseverance. Amen. Uh, the truth of the matter is, let me see, and there we go. The truth of the matter is, the wise men had actually seen the star appear in the east, and it appeared as a sign, and they knew, according to prophecy, where the the uh, child was supposed to be born, this promised child, the Messiah. They knew by prophecy where the child was supposed to be born. So when they saw the star, they immediately began to go to that place where they knew the child was to be born. It was not a matter of the star appeared in the sky and remained there for the entire time that they followed it. That is not how the events transpired. But according to our primary text today, we understand a number of things. We understand that when the wise men, these foreigners who understood uh, Jewish faith and Jewish prophecy, when they arrived in Israel, they began to inquire around Jerusalem uh, about this child because, listen, the baby had been born quite some time earlier. So therefore, even though they understood where the child was to be found uh, in terms of prophecy, it had taken them quite a long time uh, to make their way to Israel. So therefore, it was very probable or very possible that the uh, baby had been moved, that the child had been moved and taken elsewhere. But they began to inquire as to, you know, do you know of the child that was to be born king of the Jews? Would you happen to know where he is now? Do you follow what I'm saying? Because two years ago, nearly a star appeared in the sky, which was the sign that this child was born. Two years ago, nearly, we began our journey. 
to Israel. But we don't know where this baby, where this child might be now, so they're inquiring. Do you follow what I'm saying? Obviously, if the star had simply stood in place for the whole two years, they wouldn't have had to have stopped and inquired, would they have? No. So they go before Herod the king and they tell him what's going on. Apparently, somebody probably overheard them and said, you know, you, you need to talk to the king about this. This sounds pretty serious. So they brought him before Herod and they explained to Herod and he asked them, well, what time frame did you see this star appear? When, when did you see this thing appear? And they told him, and we know that it was nearly or about two years prior by the fact that later Herod killed all the children two years and younger in the area of Bethlehem. Now, they leave Herod's presence, having now heard from the scribes, the Pharisees, the experts on prophecy. And the experts all say, well, the child was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So now they leave the king's presence, and at this point I can only imagine they're thinking, well, could it be possible that he is still there? So what do they do? They leave, and they're making their way. They're getting ready to go back toward Bethlehem. And all of a sudden, what happens? The star has once again appeared. But this time, it stayed in the sky until they got to where the Lord was. Oh my goodness. Now do you understand how things transpired? That star didn't stay in the sky the entire time. No, it had gone away. It appeared as a sign. It was just a sign. It appeared once as a sign. Then it disappeared. But then when they left Herod's presence, the Word of God tells us that once again they saw the star. And the Bible said, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with great joy. Hallelujah. Because they knew now we're going to be able to find this baby wherever he may be, wherever he's at, we're going to find this baby. And they found the child, but the Word of God tells us, listen folks, there's so much tradition that we fall into, and the tradition is inaccurate, it's wrong, it's not biblical. The wise men did not bring their gifts to, to, to Jesus in the manger. It's not how it happened. Time has passed. There's been a change in circumstances. Obviously, Mary and Joseph didn't stay in the manger forever. They had only gone to uh, Bethlehem for the purpose of the taxation, you remember? So obviously, once that was all done, uh, they were able to go back home again. Now, it's possible because uh, travel at that hour, at that time in history, was so tedious and so difficult, and Mary had just had a new baby. It's very possible that Joseph decided, you know what, let's set up housekeeping here for a little while. Let's just stay here in Bethlehem for a little while instead of going straight back uh, to uh, Nazareth. You know, let's go ahead and stay here in the area for a little while. And it's possible he found work and they set up housekeeping because all we know is that when uh, the wise men finally showed up, they did not show up in a manger, the word of God said, and when they found the house, the baby and the mother were now in a house. Because at this point, baby Jesus is no longer an infant in in the manger, he is now almost a two-year-old boy. They found the boy and his mother in the house, and they presented their gifts to him. All right, amen. Now, once they found him, the Word of God tells us they knew better than to go back to Herod and say, okay, we found where the kid lives. Here's the town. Here's the place. Here's the setting. They knew better than that. So instead, they took an alternate way home so that Herod wouldn't even have any idea of where they had been. Amen. You know, I remember years ago when I, I had a friend in New York City, and I ran into him. Uh, I was vacationing up in Massachusetts, and I ran into my friend, and he was from New York City, and he had fallen sick. <clears throat> he had a form of muscular dystrophy, 
and he could barely hold his arms literally up like this. He, he couldn't carry a tray. He couldn't carry anything. He, bless his heart, his arms just hung by his sides, and he could barely hold them up like this. And he was going through an awful hard time, and he walked. His legs kind of dragged when he walked, and bless his heart. I, I felt so bad for him. And he asked me, he said, Charles, ha have you ever thought about maybe living for a while in New York City? And I said, oh man, no, I have no desire in the universe to live in New York City. That's, you know, I grew up about uh, an hour from New York City by car. And then once you got into the city, it would take you another hour just to get wherever you wanted to go in the city by car. So, uh, you know, the congestion and the traffic and the noise and the people and all that. I, I grew up in a small southern New England town. I wasn't interested in living in New York. And I told my friend Richard, I said, no, Richard, honey, I'm not, I'm not interested in living in New York. He said, well, you know, I'm going through this issue with my muscular dystrophy and everything. He said, things are kind of getting bad. And I've tried to have roommates and I've tried to have people stay with me to kind of help me uh, not just financially, but to help me physically to do some things around the house and everything. And he said, I've had people that have stolen from me and I've had people that have become abusive and all kinds of things. And he said, I just don't know what to do. He said, I was hoping maybe, since I know you, I was hoping maybe you would come and I could count on you because I know you. And I said, well... I'll tell you what, Richard, I said, I'll, I'll come out and visit for a little bit, I said, and, and uh, you know, if I think it's possible, I said, I might can come for a year or so and stay with you for a year or so. I said, but honestly, I doubt I could do more than that in, in New York, you know. So anyway, I went to New York for a week or so, kind of looked around for jobs to see if, you know, there was any work to be had. I wound up securing a job at a car dealership selling cars in Brooklyn, and he lived in Brooklyn. And so I told him, I said, I can stay with you. I said, but... Uh, we would have to get a two-bedroom apartment because he had only a, a large one-bedroom apartment there in Brooklyn. I said, we'd have to get a two-bedroom so we could each have our own space. I don't want to be staying out in the living room and that sort of thing, you know. So he talked to his landlord, and they happened to have another building just right up the street, and uh, we were able to get a two-bedroom apartment. Long story short... By the time it was all said and done, my circumstances changed over time. And even though after about a year, Richard wound up, his condition worsened, and he went back to Puerto Rico to be with his family, uh, I wound up staying in New York. And I wound up there for 10 years by the time it was all said and done. Now, mind you, that happened to me. And I'm living in the 20th century where all I had to do to go home again, you know, to go somewhere else was get on a train or rent a U-Haul or do, you know, there were any number of things I could do. But circumstances kind of cemented me for a while to New York, my job and relationships and what have you. So I fully understand how Mary and Joseph could have kind of gotten tied to their new environment for a while. You know, it happens. Things like this happen. And especially at a time when you'd have to travel by donkey or travel by horse or what have you, uh, hundreds of miles and how difficult that could be. So Mary and Joseph were in, uh, they were not yet li living in Nazareth. They were living probably still in the Bethlehem area when nearly two years had passed and the wise men came. They presented their gifts to the Lord. And at that point, the, the Spirit of God, the Word of the Lord tells us that God spoke to the wise men. For those of you people, they, you know, there are cults and there are organizations out there that just twist and pervert things so out of context and so crazy. They try to make these wise men to be 
evil men because you know they were astrologers and they were this and they were that well I'm going to tell you a little secret they couldn't have been too bad because God warned them in a dream not to go uh, home via Herod the Lord let them know in a dream. Well, obviously, they couldn't have been too bad of fellas. There had to be some sort of sincerity in their heart to be willing to come and find this baby, number one. And then when the Lord warned them in a dream, they took that advice and they went home another way so Herod wouldn't know where they had been. And at that point, the, the Spirit of the Lord also spoke to Joseph in a dream and said, get this baby out of here. You need to get out of this area as quickly as you can. Boy, I'm going to tell you, one thing I love about God, when God tells you to do something, listen to me, children, He's given you the resources you need to do what you need to do. People say, well, what in the world would Joseph and Mary have done with the frankincense, the gold, the myrrh? These were expensive, valuable substances that the wise men gave to them. What would they have done with that? Why, they could have started out, you know, a pretty good little life with that. If Joseph was working in Bethlehem and all of a sudden you uh, got hold of, let's say, you know, $10,000 worth of stuff, that was valuable that you could sell, you know, then obviously you could do pretty well for yourself. You could set yourself up pretty well. But the circumstances demanded that Joseph and Mary take the baby and flee that area immediately and go into Egypt. So now they had to go into a foreign country and they had to somehow find a way to set up housekeeping and stay in a foreign country for enough time for Herod to die. And that took a few years. But guess what? God had already given them the resources they needed. So now they had what the wise men had brought them. And that became the resources they needed to live on for the entire time they were in Egypt. You know, things back in those days weren't altogether different than they are now. We've got people today who can't stand uh, immigrants. I mean, you know, somebody, if you think that the people of Egypt were thrilled every time somebody crossed their border and came into their country, uh, that may have been true for some, but it wasn't true for all. People are always protective of what they've got. People are always wanting uh, to maintain a certain status quo, you know, and they don't want somebody infringing on theirs, you know. And so when Mary and Joseph and the baby wound up in Egypt, they didn't necessarily arrive to a warm welcome. And, you know, people weren't just saying, oh yeah, hey, I'll hire you, I'll give you a job. You know, here, come stay with me, you know, I'll open my home up to you. But they had the resources they needed that God had just provided for them, literally just provided for them to make the move. And not only to make the move, but to keep them sufficiently provided for, for the entire time that they were there. And then Herod turns around and finds out that the wise men have left and that they didn't bother to come back by and let him know as he had asked them to, uh, to let the, him know where this young man was. And he became angry and he figured, well, the easiest way then that I can solve this problem is we know the child was supposed to be born in Bethlehem and we know that according to the wise men, the star appeared first first about two years ago. So therefore, I'm going to send my armies into the area of Bethlehem and they're going to kill all the children under two years of age. Can you imagine what a horrible Hitler-like experience to suddenly have the armies of Rome coming in and destroying all the... Can you, I mean, that was a horrible purge, you know. That had to be a horrific time. But again, even this had been prophesied in Scripture concerning the death of all these children. Even this had been spoken. Even the Lord's being sent into Egypt had been prophesied. You see... 
we see a series, a string, a chain of prophecies which were all fulfilled. Folks, Christmas was not all about one singular day and one singular event. No, when you look at the coming of Christ and when you look at the circumstances surrounding the arrival of the Lord, you see years worth of prophecies which were all fulfilled in succession, just exactly as they had been prophesied. I'm here to tell you today, there are a lot of Christians who make big mistakes when they read prophetic words in the Word of God. You know, I grew up in the Pentecostal church where they just love to scare the fire out of people. You know, oh, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. They love to use that as a fear mechanism, as a way of scaring people to the altar and scaring people into the kingdom of God, which was entirely wrong and inappropriate. It should not have been done that way. When I was a kid, Tommy, the favorite prophecy that you would hear people make reference to, the one thing that you would hear people most frequently make reference to is, the Bible said there will be wars and rumors of wars. That was the most, in my mind anyway, that was the favorite prophecy that everybody would point to. And the fact that we had Vietnam going on when I was a child, you know, and the fact that the world was in such turmoil uh, and Israel was going through so much difficulty and uh, Ireland was going through so much difficulty with the IRA and buses were being blown up and planes were being commandeered and all kinds of things were happening and all kinds of negativity was going on. And I remember my grandma and other Christians always say, oh, the Lord could come tomorrow. Hallelujah. Why? How do we know? Well, because the Bible said there'd be wars and rumors of war. And that one simple prophetic word was supposed to be sufficient to let us know that the Lord's return was imminent. And they would use that to terrify people and to scare them to death. But you know, it doesn't work that way. The Lord's first coming didn't work that way. The Lord's first coming wasn't, uh, he did not first come with a single prophecy and a single fulfillment. Because if that's all it had been, then it really would be kind of tough to believe on Jesus Christ as the Messiah if all it was was, you know, one prophecy or one word here, one word there. But when you look at the sum of the whole, when you look at all the different prophetic words that played out over the course of years, all of a sudden you realize, wow, there were a whole series of prophecies concerning this boy, concerning this child that went well beyond yesterday. I'm calling my message today beyond yesterday. Yesterday was Christmas. Oh, but there was still a whole lot more to happen beyond yesterday. Amen. I'm here to tell you concerning the coming of the Lord, there's still a whole lot more to happen beyond yesterday. Things that happened yesterday, things that happened last year, that doesn't mean that everything has happened that needs to happen. That doesn't mean everything has come uh, to pass that needs to come to pass. In Matthew chapter 50, uh, 16 verses 1 through 3, the word of the Lord said, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came. You won't see that very often. These were two sects within the Jewish faith. You might say the Pentecostals and the Baptists. Well, you're not going to see those two get together a whole lot and do anything. But when they wanted to try to trip Jesus up, all of a sudden, it's funny how different groups within the Jewish faith could get together if they thought they were going to trip the Lord up. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he should show them a sign from heaven. Prove to us that you're the Messiah. Prove to us that you're the promised one, the anointed one. He answered and said unto them, 
When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but, ye, but can ye not discern the signs of the time? The Lord said, you know, you guys can go outside and you can pretty accurately determine whether or not it's going to be a nice day or a bad day. All you got to do is look at the sky. You look at the color of the clouds. You look at the composition of the clouds. You know, uh, here in Florida, Tommy and I look up at the sky sometimes and say, well, it's cloudy, but it's all fluffy white clouds, you know. We're not seeing those heavy, dark clouds, which would indicate rain or storms are coming. So even though there are clouds in the sky, the, the clouds are such that they indicate good weather, am I telling the truth? The Lord said, you can look up in the sky and you can discern the weather, but the signs have been before you all this time and you haven't figured it out yet. And you're still asking me to show you something or to do something specific to indicate that I am the Christ, the chosen one, the anointed one. The scribes and Pharisees, so often at odds with one another, could come together long enough to try and convince the Lord to, to give them a sign which might prove his status as the promised Messiah. But the Lord uh, points them to the fact that any number of prophetic signs had already been fulfilled, and yet they were unable or they failed to see what was right before them. They could look at the sky and determine with relative certainty the weather that will come, but they could not see what was plainly before them. My Lord, have mercy and determine that in fact he was the promised one. Oh, I'm here to tell you there was a whole lot more to Christmas than yesterday. You know, it's funny how we are as human beings. We get all anxious and excited about Christmas. We get all anxious and excited about the day. And I mean, you know, we go out, we make all our preparations. Even here this year, I was able to put together a little meal for my family. My mother, my brother, and Tommy and I were able to have a little family dinner. And for the first time in years, I actually cooked a turkey. I haven't done that in quite a while. But I actually cooked a turkey. Yeah, raw turkey. I didn't buy a pre-cooked turkey and heat it up. I actually cooked a turkey. And uh, we bought some sides that were prepared that all you had to do was heat them up in the oven, you know, or heat them up in the microwave. Because these days I tend to get very tired very quickly, so I knew I couldn't do all the preparation. But a few things I had to do myself, the sweet potatoes and my mother's turnips. My mother, you can't have Thanksgiving or Christmas without turnips. My mother loved her turnips. I told Tommy when we were shopping for ingredients for our little get-together, I said, my mother will never forgive me if I forget the turnips. Of course, we got everything except one thing we did forget. And then we're sitting at the table and my brother Dallas says, where's the cranberry sauce? Well, we'd gotten everything, but by God, cranberry sauce wasn't in our thought process. We completely forgot. So there it ruined. Christmas was ruined. But we had our little Christmas dinner, you know. And uh, But it's so funny how once Christmas arrives, it's like the next day, it's almost like it never even happened. It's so anticlimactic. It's always rather anticlimactic, isn't it? You know, we, sp we spend all our energy and all our imagination thinking about how things are going to go. They never quite go the way we imagine them going, though. You know, we think mom's going to open her gift and be in tears and excited and thrilled, and instead she opens it and says, oh, how nice, thank you. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I thought I was going to get a whole lot better response out of her than that. Or the kids, you know. Parents talk all the time about, I bought my kid these things they've been talking about wanting forever. And they wound up spending more time playing with the boxes that I had to pack those things in than they did with the things that were in the boxes. 
You know, when the day comes, things tend to be very anticlimactic, and we can easily forget about yesterday. Well, Christmas was yesterday. Well, doggone it, it was fun while I was here. You know the old song, uh, once the party's over, well, the party's over, honey. Now it's over, so now what? Well, I'm going to tell you, it'd be easy if the Lord's identity were all wrapped up in just this little prophecy or that little prophecy concerning Christmas Day or the day of his arrival, it'd be easy to just kind of approach it and say, well, see, that was kind of anticlimactic, and then we leave, and before too long, everybody's forgotten about it, and it's over. Do you follow me now? Oh, but when you've got prophecy linked to prophecy, linked to prophecy, linked to prophecy, and it goes on and on and on over the course of years, then it constantly is keeping that truth in your consciousness. It's constantly keeping his identity in front of you. And for those of us who believe afterward, long afterward, we're able to look at the printed page and we're able to simply look at, my goodness, look at all these prophecies that were fulfilled. Look at all these different things. The Old Testament prophet said this, and then lo and behold, this happened. The Old Testament prophecy said this, and then lo and behold, this happened, you see? And we're able to see, and that helps us to believe. Well, I'm here to tell you today, you can't think about the Lord's first coming without thinking about His second coming. Amen. You can't think about the Lord's first coming without thinking about his second coming. If he could come the first time according to his promise, and if he could fulfill every prophecy that was spoken concerning him the first time, then why in the world would you think that that won't be true the second time? Amen. Think about it for a minute. Why would you think it would not be true the second time? In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul writes, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering unto, together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. This is speaking, I've mentioned this before, this is speaking of the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So while you've got people who want to fear monger and want to scare people into heaven, they think they're scaring them into heaven. They're not scaring them into heaven. They're just scaring the hell out of them. They're not scaring anybody into heaven. But honey, they, we've got people in the church that want to use fear as a mechanism for driving people toward God, and that doesn't work. That is not how things ought to be done. Paul said in First and Second Thessalonians 2, he said, this isn't going to happen. The return of the Lord isn't going to happen. He said, until this first happens. So guess what? Even though the Lord talked about wars and rumors of wars, wars and rumors of wars were not the end all and be all. That was not the end of the story. No, the story goes beyond yesterday. There's more than just a child being born in Bethlehem. There's more than just a star appearing in the sky as a sign. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? There's more to what transpired yesterday. 
And furthermore, I'm going to tell you a little secret. When the Lord said there would be wars and rumors of wars, what he in reality was saying was, life will go on as life has always gone on. There has never been a time in human history when there have not been wars and rumors of wars. There never has been a time. So when the Lord said this, he knew that he wasn't saying anything extraordinary. He understood that. But unfortunately, you've got people who want to read the Bible out of context. They want to pull stuff out of context. And they try to make it something extraordinary. No, the Lord said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Men, uh, people are going to be married. They're going to be given in marriage. They're going to celebrate. They're going to have parties. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Got news for you. Wars and rumors of wars is an extension of that. It, life's going to go on as it's always gone on. There's going to be wars just like there's always been wars. There's going to be rumors of wars just like there's always always been rumors to you. follow what I'm saying? So the Lord, when he spoke of wars and rumors of wars, he wasn't even talking about anything new. He was simply trying to say that in many regards, things are going to be as they've always been. It's going to be the same thing. But now Paul goes in 2 Thessalonians and explains that there will be an extraordinary series of events that are going to take place, which will signal that the sky is changing color. That'll signal that the weather's about to change, that things are turning different. You hear what I'm telling you now? Can you discern the face of the sky? Yeah. Well, then you ought to be able to discern that as the Lord's coming draws closer, he said, there are going to be things happening that are more and more obvious. There are going to be things happening which are more and more dramatic. If, according to Paul, the Lord's return will not take place until first the Antichrist has made his appearance, number one, but secondly, he said that this Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Well, guess what? That passage tells us a lot about the timing around the Lord's coming. Guess what does not exist today? The temple. The temple in Jerusalem doesn't even exist. We have the Dome of the Rock, a uh, Islamic structure that sits right in the middle of the temple grounds in Jerusalem. And there has been a great deal of controversy ever since Israel was reconstituted as a nation way back in 48. There's been a great deal of controversy about this um, uh, Dome of the Rock having been erected by the Palestinians, by the uh, Arab people uh, on the site of the temple. They cannot reconstruct the temple with the Dome of the Rock sitting there. It is impossible because the temple has to be exactly as God designed it and exactly as he instructed the people of Israel to build it. And guess what? The Dome of the Rock doesn't fit into the floor plan. Well, now think about it for a minute. You'd start World War III if you tried to knock down the Dome of the Rock so you could rebuild the temple. So we've got a huge issue here. We've got a huge problem here. But before the Lord returns, we know that the temple will have to be rebuilt because it... The uh, Antichrist can't possibly sit in the Holy of Holies and declare himself to be God if the temple does not exist. So, instead of getting all worried, instead of getting all nervous, instead of being full of fear, instead of preachers preaching fear, they ought to simply be saying, we have got some very tangible, very real, very 
dramatic signs to be on the lookout for. The minute you get word that the temple is being reconstructed in Israel, honey, get excited because that means the Lord's coming is very, very close. That means the clouds are starting to get dark. That means you can see the storm on the horizon, that things are about to change in a dramatic and powerful way. But until you see that, now there are a lot of people who say, oh, well, I can just play games with God then. I don't have to even worry about being a Christian. I don't even have to worry about living for the Lord. Um, the Word of God talks about servants who play because the master's away, and they play games, and they act in ways they ought not to act. Um, that's a very dangerous game to play. I, you, you can do it if you want to, but I'm happy to be in the Father's house. I'm happy to be in the fold. I'm happy to be secure in my salvation and waiting for the coming of the Lord. I'm not going to be trying to play games just because His coming does not appear in, uh, immediate and imminent. But I want to tell you a little secret. There are some things that are very exciting I had a man in, in uh, New York City that I knew some years back. He was a Jewish fella. And there was an interdenominational Bible study that I used to participate in at the LGBT Community Center on 13th Street in Manhattan, uh, there in New York City. And this Jewish fella actually participated in these Bible studies. He was an awful nice fellow. And one day after our Bible study, he and I think Claude and I uh, went out and we decided we were going to have a meal together. And we went to a diner there in New York, you know. And uh, we were eating and talking. And, and I was telling this man, his name's Charlie, and I was telling Charlie about... Uh, some of the things that are unique to the apostolic faith and to our doctrine concerning the Godhead and concerning uh, a number of things. And he said, man, he said, do you know that what you're describing, he said, as a Jew, that actually works. He said, we're taught that the Trinity, you know, just doesn't fit into our our knowledge of God whatsoever, it doesn't fit into our theology at all. He said, but what you're describing, the oneness of God, the deity of Christ, he said, that actually works. He said, as a Jew, I can believe that. I said, well, Charlie, who do you think made up the whole first part of the early church? It was all Jews. So the message must have been something that they could embrace. It had to be something that was not completely contrary, completely foreign to anything they had ever understood. I said, that's why we're called apostolic. We preach the same message the apostles preached. Nothing different. We don't bring in man-made tradition. We don't bring man-made dogma in. If the apostles didn't preach the Trinity, neither do we. But they did preach the divinity of Christ. They did preach that Christ and God are one. And so anyway, we were talking, and he got all excited about it. And then at one point, I was telling him, I said, do you know what one of the signs that we're waiting for concerning the arrival of Messiah the second time? I said, I know it's a Jew. You're waiting for him to show up the first time. I said, we believe he's already been here. And now we're just waiting for him to come back. I said, but do you know what we're waiting on right now? I said, do you know what the most dramatic and the most powerful sign that will indicate he is shortly to return is? And he said, no, what? I said, we're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And boy, I'm here to tell you, and I'm getting chills thinking about it. This man's eyes just grew. <laughs> I thought they were going to pop out of his head. His eyes grew wide. And he said, oh, he said, I could tell you something about that. And I said, you can tell me that there are groups in Israel who have already sown all the 
curtains and draperies and all the um, items for the temple made of cloth and they're already made and prepared exactly to the uh, to the mandate of the Torah and all the golden vessels and all the accoutrements have already been cast according to the requirements of the Torah. And he looked at me and his, his eyebrows furrowed and he said, how do you know that? He said, that's exactly what I was just going to tell you. He said, how do you know that? I said, oh honey, we got missionaries in Israel. I said, they hear things. They turned around and come back and they told us what was going on. And we had apostolic missionaries in Israel and they had heard that there were groups of, you know, within Israel, priests and what have you. And they were putting all these things together in preparation for the temple being rebuilt. So they already got every single thing they need. Think about it for a minute. The temple is a huge undertaking. Now, in biblical times, it took them decades to build it. In modern times, with modern tools, it wouldn't take them but a year or so, probably, to build it. The foundations are already there, right? But when they do get it built, they're not going to spend years afterwards trying to make everything that goes inside the temple that God has mandated needs to be there. The incense altar and all these other items, you know, they don't have to do, no, no, all those things are ready. Just think about moving into a new house. If you've got everything you need before you ever move in, just think about it. How easy is it then to set up shop and to start doing what you're supposed to be doing in that space if you've already got everything you need for the inside of it? And in Israel, they already have everything they need for the interior of the temple. But here's something that's even a little bit more exciting. We know that the temple that exists Today, the ruins of the temple, the, the actual full temple does not exist, but the ruins of the temple. That temple had been erected by Herod as a gift to the people of Israel before the Lord came. And that temple uh, had been erected by him as a means of kind of placating the people of Israel because their nation was occupied by a foreign foreign nation, Rome. So this was a way of kind of placating the people so they wouldn't rise up and try to, you know, overthrow the Roman uh, invaders and what have you. This was kind of a political move that was made to placate the uh, the nation of Israel and the people of Israel. You'll be able to practice your faith and you'll be able to practice it just exactly the way you're supposed to because you're going to have your temple and everything. But now here's the interesting thing that I've come to understand in recent years. There is now great controversy over whether Herod built that temple on the exact location of the first temple because there are some now who say that in fact he did not which means that if the experts in Israel ever come to terms with this because they're debating it now if they ever come to terms with this and if they ever determine that in fact Herod's gift temple was built on a location that was not exactly where God said it was to be built. And they've determined where the other location that they believe the temple originally existed, the first temple, where it was. If it be determined that they're right, and that the new temple not even be on the right spot, guess what, folks? That means the true temple will be able to be rebuilt without anything being in its way. 
the Dome of the Rock wouldn't even be an issue. They'll be able to rebuild the new temple in record time. They'll be able to do it without any obstructions because the site that they believe the temple actually, where it actually is supposed to have been, is elsewhere. It's off at a different spot than where the current temple ruins exist. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Say, well, Pastor, why are you telling me all this? I'm trying to tell you that beyond all the warnings and all the cries and all the prophecies of yesterday that preachers may have told you and Christians may have told you and grandma may have told you, oh, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be this, there'll be that. The Bible said all that. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was all yesterday, but beyond yesterday there's more beyond Christmas Day there was more there was still more prophecy to be fulfilled there was still more promises to be realized in order to help us identify the true Messiah that had been sent hello now I'm here to tell you beyond yesterday there's more there's more to come and God has given us the means whereby we can know that the day of the Lord is drawing closer and closer. He promised he'd come the first time and he kept his promise. He promised he'd come a second time. And I'm here to tell you today, folks, he's going to keep his promise. Amen. And lastly today in Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 29, listen to what the Lord said. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall, then, listen, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather them uh, shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. I want to tell you a little secret. The Lord has made it clear that his coming, just like the first time, was something only to be celebrated and to be received with joy. The Word of God says the Lord is coming for those two things. One, it says, who love His appearing. It doesn't say those who are terrified of His appearing. It said those who love His appearing. That's who He's coming for. And secondly, the Word of God says He's coming for those that look for His appearing. Got news for you, folks. You don't love something and you don't look for something that you're terrified of, that you're afraid of. God has not given us, the word of the Lord says, the spirit of fear. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. He promised he'd come the first time. He gave us a number of signs that would indicate who he was. And every single one of those things came to pass over the course of time. It didn't all happen on one day. It didn't all happen on Christmas morning. Beyond yesterday, there was yet more. Well, I've got news for you. Beyond yesterday, beyond what you heard preachers preach yesterday, beyond what you heard television preachers tell you yesterday, there is more that is to come to pass. And not one jot or not one tittle is going to go unfulfilled until the Lord returns. And we have signs that we can look for. We have very solid Dramatic, visible signs. I'll tell you, a lot of people out there playing games right now. I wouldn't be playing games right now because if you miss the boat on the first trip, 
honey, you're going to have to wait three and a half years for the next boat. This passage I just read to you in Mark chapter 13, this doesn't speak of the rapture of the church. And this is one of the biggest mistakes, and I'm trying to close up. This is one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they study the Word of God. They confuse the rapture of the church with the second coming of Christ. The second coming is when he literally, physically returns to planet Earth. The rapture, he does not return to earth. He appears in the clouds, and the church is caught up to join him in the clouds. He never touches earth. The second coming is when he is going to put to flight all the enemies of Israel, when the battle of Armageddon will be fought, when uh, he is going to establish his identity as the Messiah and as God for the nation of Israel, and he returns, he physically returns to planet Earth. But listen, that last passage I read to you is not a rapture passage. It's a second coming passage. But I guarantee you, as I read it, there are a lot of people out there, you're hearing me read it, and you're thinking of it as a rapture passage. But there are many ways we know it is not a rapture passage. He said, but in those days, after that tribulation, well, the Lord said in other scripture that that tribulation he's speaking of would not happen until the Antichrist declared himself to be God in the temple, at which point the church will be called up. The church is going to be called out of the earth. Why? Because God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. And the second half, the three and a half years of tribulation, is a period of judgment on the world for rejecting God and embracing the Antichrist. So the people who are going to be judged during the second half of the tribulation are those who have not only rejected God, the true God, but they have embraced the Antichrist, even to the extent of receiving his mark, so on and so forth, okay? But he said, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened. So all of a sudden, this very dramatic thing is going to transpire. The sun's going to go black. The moon will not give her light. The stars of heaven are going to fall. Just imagine shooting stars. Can you imagine if it appeared as though the stars were literally falling out of heaven? And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see. If you remember Pastor Charles teaching you over the years, I've told you over and over again, whenever you see the pronouns we, us, our, that is referring to the believer. That's referring to the church. When you see them, they, those, etc., that is speaking of the world. This passage says... And then shall they see. He doesn't say, then shall you see. Hallelujah. No, the church ain't going to be seeing this. We're not going to be here to experience this. He said, then shall they see. Oh, hallelujah. The Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather Together his elect from the four winds. What does he mean by his elect? Those who during the tribulation have resisted the beast. Because there are going to be, according to the word of God, there are going to be those who do not submit to the beast. There are going to be those who've heard preachers like me and who have heard preachers expound upon how these things are going to transpire. And when it happens, they're going to be able to look back and say, oh my God, I remember this preacher I used to watch online. I remember this preacher I had as a kid. And he said all these things were going to happen. And by God, they've happened. And when the Antichrist appears, they're going to know better. 
them to fall for his charms because they are going to be aware of all these things. You remember those three wise men? They weren't believers. They weren't Jews. They weren't part of the Jewish faith, but they were aware of Jewish teaching. They were aware of Jewish prophecy. They were aware of signs within Jewish belief systems. I'll tell you, there's going to be a lot of people after the Lord's taken his church out of here. They weren't believers. They didn't want to participate in the first home going. But they're going to be smart enough to know, I've got to keep myself. I've got to prevent myself from doing those things which the Word of God warned me about so that I can be part of the Lord's second gathering. Because the Word of God doesn't say at the rapture that God's going to send His angels to gather, does He? No. said, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Doesn't say a word about angels being involved in the gathering. But after the tribulation, the angels, hallelujah, are going to be sent to gather. The word of God says that many of those people are literally going to be living underground. They're going to be hiding in caves. They're going to be hiding in various hiding places because they're literally going to have to be in fear of their lives. But the angels are going to go and gather them and say, oh, you can come out now. <laughs> the king is coming. Hallelujah. The king is coming. Look up. Look up. <laughs> the stars are falling. The sun is dark. There is no moonlight. The king is in the sky. Look, there's no more reason to hide. There's no re more reason to fear. Glory to God. We cannot simply see one sign and assume that all things are now fulfilled. The Lord has given us a complex series, or a web, as it were, of signs, all of which help us to know we are drawing closer to the Lord's second coming for His church. There is no reason to fear, but rather only cause for hope and joy. Each day a new sign appears, and every day we are one day closer to home than we were the day before. Amen. I love to sing that old song. I'm nearer home than I was yesterday. There may be more beyond yesterday. Amen. Christmas won the end all and be all. There was more beyond yesterday. But the day is coming when the last and final yesterday will have been lived. And there will be no more tomorrows to come. Hallelujah. Because it will be one eternal day without a night. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I hope that this brought you some comfort today and encouraged your heart and helped you to understand Christmas wasn't all over after one single day. There was more beyond yesterday. And this thing is not going to be over with simply one sign here or one sign there. There's more yet to come. Glory to God. Let me just... Amen. I want to close our service today with a song as we've been trying to do the last few weeks. Praise God. Amen. I love this old song. It says, We shall see the King when He comes. Amen. Listen, time that's coming coming soon it may be even morning or at noon the wedding of the bride united with the groom we shall see the king when he comes we shall see the king we shall see the king. We shall see the king.
according to every promise and he'll come the second time the same way nothing will go unfulfilled nothing he has prophesied or spoken is going to not come to pass first so there's nothing to fear we only have so much more to look forward to beyond yesterday hallelujah master we love you god today and we thank you lord for the opportunity oh god to be in your presence we thank you lord for the joy the excitement the enthusiasm that the word of god brings to our lives lord when you understand this thing in truth there is a thing in the world to be afraid of there is a thing in the world to be terrified by when you understand this thing in truth there is only power there's only love there is only a sound mind master today in the name of jesus bring to life the words which i have spoken today in the heart of every hearer every individual today lord who's been able to hear this message let them meditate upon that which they've heard and let their heart be glad oh lord today let their heart be glad yes yesterday was christmas yesterday was the day messiah was born oh but there's so much more beyond yesterday and lord today we thank you for the promise of your coming the first time we thank you for the fulfillment of that promise we thank you lord for the promise of your second coming for your church for the redemption of your body your bride we look forward to that day with great joy master in the name of jesus go with us from this place as tommy and i travel back to texas lord we ask that you would protect us guide us keep ourselves our babies our animals our property safe free from harm 
Lord, help us to arrive back to Dallas with renewed vision and enthusiasm to do whatever work lay before us that we need to do. We ask God that you would open the doors that need to open, close doors that need to close. Place us, God, in the right place at this hour in the history of our nation and in the history of our world there has to be an on fire holy ghost filled church that is able god to bring revival to the hearts of so many who have lost their way so many today who have been led astray and caused to look the wrong way help us lord to be that catalyst for revival that the church in america so desperately needs help us lord today to be on fire for god let our passion overwhelm us this hour god and our zeal today fill us to overflowing master we ask all this and lord i lift up sister cynthia why shall today she and her husband have just gone through a great trouble in their lives once again as Cynthia recovers from her surgery Lord their house has flooded and so many things have been ruined and destroyed and we don't know what you're doing in their lives we don't know the direction that you're trying to point them in but we ask God today that you would minister to them in a mighty powerful wonderful way right now in the name of Jesus provide Lord for their every need and Lord help them to know your wisdom and your guidance at this hour direct them in the path of righteousness for your name's sake we ask all this today oh God in none other than Jesus wonderful powerful glorious name amen praise God and amen folks we're so glad you were able to be with us during our time here in Florida we look forward to seeing you uh, next Sunday, God willing, at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. We should be in Dallas at that time. So we hope to see you then for worshiping the Word. God bless you in Jesus' name is my prayer.